Our next presentation is from Dr. Paul Tang. Paul Tang completed his cardiothoracic surgery training at Duke University Medical Center, where he also received advanced training in heart transplantation, ventricular assist devices, and aortic surgery. He has given talks and published widely on the natural history of, and surgical outcomes of these diseases. At Yale University, Dr. Tang completed a PhD focused on cardiovascular immunology. Dr. Tang's clinical practice includes surgical treatment of heart failure, valvular repair or replacement, and aortic aneurysm surgery. He is an investigator in various national clinical trials for heart failure management and is a member of professional societies such as the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation, Southern Thoracic Surgical Association, American Heart Association, and the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Thank you for joining us. Thank, thanks, uh, Sarah, for that, for that intro. And, and um, thanks again for the opportunity to present in this forum. And, and it's an exciting opportunity for me to, to uh, um, share, some, uh, share some things about L LVAD systems and how they work and a little bit about the mechanics and, and theory of operation. And uh, so just going to get going here. Um, I have no conflicts of interest or disclosures. So the topics we're going to discuss, um, rotary pump mechanics, so power, power curves or, and um, uh, HQ curves, you know, sounds very technical, but we'll get into that in a little bit. And I hope I can, and can make it easy to understand. It certainly took me a little bit to wrap my head, head around things. Um, uh, some things about heart rate three parameters, which is the main LVAD now that we use and what's pulsatility index, what does it mean? When does it happen? How you know how to interpret it? What do you do, and, and how that relates to pump flow? Um, and also, I think it, when talking about parameters and speed and flow, and this is important. I think to also think a little bit about the associated valve pathologies, and because that can impact um, some of the the output you see on on the LVAD, um, and that relates to aortic mitral tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, and we'll go into that at the very end once we get through some of the heavier um, engineering stuff. Um, so you, just a brief intro slide, evolution LVAD devices um, is, is really a, a, a very exciting area of mechanical support. And in terms of the, just the concept of replacing or, or, or assisting with some of the cardiac functions um, and, and, and how this technology advances and and how it tackles many, many of the problems and how engineers really focused on problems and, and, and built their engineering around resolving some of those. Um, so it started with an ex extracorporeal pneumatic pulsatile device and it's, it's, uh, the pump itself is outside the body. You've got big hoses outside the body that's driven by air. Um, you've basically got a small fridge size, uh, a contraption uh, that, that pushes the air and drives the pump and that's the first generation. And then, They'll start bulky and, I, um, and then came the second generation where the pump is implantable, it's electrically driven and it's pulsatile, but it's still got a lot of moving parts, um, which impaired the longevity of the pump. Um, and it's still very large and only fits in patients of certain sizes and may not provide reliable support for long and, and um, produce the produce patients to heart transplant. And, and I think the, the next big iteration is the continuous flow, where, which was introduced by the heart mate, arrival of heart rate two. Um, uh, people realized that you don't really need pulsatile flow and, and, a, and that allowed a simpler mechanism of, of rotary, whether it's axial or centrifugal um, to provide flow. And that just by the mechanics, it was, you were able to design a pump that was much more reliable, uh, less apt to fail. And electrically driven, still has a cord going outside. And the first one, heart rate two with the axial design, that pump had problems in terms of little well, problems that we see now, but you know, it was obviously much better than the previous um, pump uh, issues with pump thrombosis, um, uh, reimplant, you know, pump exchanges and strokes and things like that in models. And then, and then came the, the, the hydrodynamic bearing where you lubricate is, is instead of being axial, kind of like a, Archimedes um, uh, screw is it's kind of like a slingshot. Um, the 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 centrifugal pumps 
where it shoots blood out, and uh, and that was a that was a, a different mechanism of continuous flow. But really, the the big we still had problems with uh, uh, thrombosis and hemolysis, and really it was the Hartmut three that arrived and with uh, with a uh, with an opponent that's basically su suspended magnetically in, in midair, not touching anything uh, that prevented blood from warming up and causing thrombosis and, and friction and, and so on that that we uh, uh, a lot of those thromb thrombus and hemolysis issue were much improved after that. And uh, heart rate three, some of the components, I think many of you would have would know about this already and I won't go um, too much in the details. Obviously there's a pump and it pumps blood into the ascending aorta through the graft and then there's two batteries and that supply blood, uh, the electricity to a controller we can change settings and that provides uh, electricity to the pump itself. Um, and it's got a, a little bend relief portion here that prevents kinking kind of prop closer to the pump and, and uh, an outflow graph inside. Um, there are a couple of cuff options that you know, surgeons always like to have uh, uh, of options and have kind of like little little things you can choose from and, and the small cuff is easier to sew in but sometimes there's tissue that's heaped up and, and the larger cuff uh, um, helps this pump engage uh, a little better on this cuff. And this is what you want, would like to see at the, at the end of the case um, uh, in the ICU or you know, have a pump that's in obviously seating well in the apex but pointing directly to the mitral valve right here. So it's got good intake and inflow uh, to the pump. Um, uh, if not, then you get into some issues, but this is, this is what you generally like to see is well orientated. Um, it doesn't look like it's pointing up or down or, or, or back or front. Um, and here's what you don't want to see, you know, pumps that are, are pointing up uh, or pointing a little down inside and, that can cause inflow obstruction and, and uh, issues that we'll talk about a little later. Um, so about the Harmony 3, I think, well, that's the pump, only pump really that's available right now. Um, uh, so I'll focus my discussion on this. And and um, uh, but the Harmony 3, like I said, is fully magnet magnetically levitated. So even if it's not rotating, it will just, it's static, it'll still float inside the pump. Um, it's got a self-centering rotor, which doesn't require, doesn't, no, it's not touching anything, so there's mecha no mechanical or, and it's not dependent on blood to uh, lubricate the, the mechanism. So it's hydrodynamic, it's not hydrodynamic. It's got very big gaps here and that allows the blood to travel and, and promotes laminar flow and uh, reduces heating as, as opposed to smaller gaps in the, in the prior hydrodynamic pump, uh, which still has some thrombosis and stroke issues. So very large, consistent blood flow pathways to reduce shear stress. It does have a, a, what we call artificial pulsatility, or a very cycle where the pump alternates its speed. So um, you get a slight pulsatility at about 30 beats per minute. It's really not designed to mimic physiological pulsatility like the, as the heart pumps in systole and diastole. It's going to wash the pump, reduce stasis, and reduce the chance of thromboembolism. And the way the pump is designed, a lot of the computing power is in the pump itself that, that, that allows it to differentiate um, uh, the power, the amount of power is delivering to each component, which becomes important. And I will discuss later on. There's the system power going to the controller from the batteries to power some of the electronics in the controller. And then there's pump power, which drive, powers the drive line, overcoming the drive line resistance um, and power some to keep the to keep the rotor elevated uh, and to power some of the motor electronics. And then this is the important component here, the rotor drive power, which is used to rot actually rotate the rotor and generate blood flow and, and being able to pinpoint exactly how much power that's using. Uh, it's a very powerful thing that, um, that allows us to determine flow. So about the pump mechanics, um, sorry, it's a busy, it's a busy figure, but, um, uh, what we all what we call the HQ curve. I think it's important this, to discuss because we'll get into a little bit about how this relates to subsequent issues that we face with uh, 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 working the the heart rate three pump and the speed and so on. 
but there's a what we call a head pressure, just a pressure across the pump. So it's basically aortic pressure minus your LV pressure, uh, and 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 um, uh, and that's the head pressure. And and then there's flow, which is Q. Um, and here, if you have a change of ten, so if your head pr the pressure across the pump has a has a difference of ten from sixty to seventy, in the heart rate three, in this operating range or here in that in this uh, pink circle, uh, flow at about four or so uh, uh, liters per minute, a small change in in uh, well a change in uh, the head pressure doesn't cause a big big drop in flow. So um, uh, so, so from five to four point five. Whereas in the heart rate two, um, the, with a small change in the head pressure, you get a big drop in flow from from five to around three. And it's and it's uh, um, what this what we call a tolerance, head pressure tolerance, or or not so not so tolerant. And it's not an all or nothing phenomenon uh, because as you see, the slope is steep here, but it is more flat here. So um, so at the operating ranges, um, uh, it, it is it is um, it is more uh, resilient to changes in head pressure, which is what you want in a pump. And it's different uh, depending on your pump speed and the kind of pump. And it's basically ingrained in the pump design itself. Um, and this is something that engineers really really um, try to optimize. And here. Like I said, um, this is a low sensitive. So if the, this is something like what we saw with the heart 3 at the lower ranges of flow, the heart 3 does have a, a is, it is low, sens low sensitive. So a small change in that, that aortic versus preload pressure. The aortic pressure is after load. The, the preload is what the pressure you have in the, in the LV. Small change in that can cause a, small, a bigger drop in flow. Whereas if you're out here, it's more resilient. So really, uh, um, uh, uh, we really want to keep the flow in that outer you know, working range. Uh, here is, is flow tolerant, um, basically showing the same thing. It's this range here. I won't go too much into that. And then there's a shutoff pressure. So the head pressure or the delta P across the pump, delta pressure, change of pressure across the pump can uh, uh, go to zero. So the head pressure. So we remember the aortic pressure, the head pressure is aortic pressure minus the, the LV pressure. So um, if you got too much aortic pressure and that and that change in that difference between aortic and, and LV pressure becomes very high, you don't get any any flow. And an extreme example is if you pinched off the, the outflow graph. So the aortic pressure is infinite, then you get no flow. So but the stump pump can still rotate at a certain speed. So that's what that means. And and there's gradations as you, you know. As you change your afterload, and the same thing with preload. The preload is so low that you don't have any blood in there. You're not going to get any flow. And uh, this again is just showing the different pump designs and how all these curves differ depending on the pump design. Um, uh, uh, basically, uh, so the reds, the the HVAD, and and the Harmit threes in the blue, and and there's another another pump, uh, the Eva Heart. Uh, it's not used. And to add, add complexity to this, you know, the, the head pressure can, can change depending on your cardiac cycle. So your preload can change, obviously, depending on whether your heart is systole and diastole, assuming there's still some contractility in your heart, despite that heart uh, uh, being a failing ventricle. So the delta P and the pump flow are inversely proportional. So the head pressure increases during diastole because you're sucking blood into the ventricle, which is uh, which means your your um, your head pressure widens and that reduces pump flow. Whereas in systole, where your heart contracts, you increase your increase the pressure in your in your ventricle. Um, uh, um, then you have uh, increased uh, uh, pump flow because that. Uh, that head pressure narrows. Um, so your pump flows is dependent somewhat on your cardiac cycle and your cardiac intrinsic, also on your intrinsic cardiac function um, and, uh, uh, and intrathoracic pressures. So how, how is that 
what does all that mean in terms of how it relates to patient management? Um, so, for example, um, uh, if you have, well, in, if you increase your, so th this is different depending on your rotor speed. So if you increase your speed, you get increase in flow. So, um, so if you decrease your preload, so, so for example, if you GI bleed or you're dehydrated um, and your filling is low, then you decrease the pump flow. And that's, that's why that happens. And if you increase your preloads, for example, you give them fluid challenge and, and uh, then it increases flow because that head pressure narrows um, and you're uh, at a set speed, it delivers more flow through the pump. By the same token, if you look at the other, the other uh, uh, factor, afterload, if you increase your afterload, um, well, if you decrease your afterload in the setting of sepsis, um, then you have more flow because um, uh, uh, now your your uh, uh, your head pressure uh, narrows, and if you increase your afterload, um, for example, hypertension, um, then you get reduced flow and increases PI. And and the relationship between uh, the pump power and flow is is more or less linear. Um, and and the and the harmony three or at least none of the VATs so far is able to adjust their speed of course, you know, to maintain flow because there's no pressure sensors. Uh, you can't really adapt to the H2 curve. So the speed you set is the speed you get and you need to manage everything else uh, in terms of pressure, preload, afterload, and so on. Uh, but the linear relationship between rotor, rotor power and flow allows, and the fact that the HeartMate 3 has a very accurate uh, a grasp on uh, rotor power like I discussed before, means it has a very gra good grasp with flow, uh, especially in the higher higher range, uh, especially in the lower ranges. Sorry. So in the lower ranges, the heart rate three is very accurate and engaging um, uh, flow, but in the very higher ranges of flow of like five or six, it becomes less accurate. But you know, um, but it doesn't really matter. We know the patient's well supported. Whether they get five liters or six liters, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter as much clinically. Um, So what speed ranges, the heart rate three can uh, range in speed from 3000 to 9000, although I've, I've never seen anyone do um, seven, eight or 9000, because um, it's just so, so the pump is really uh, over-engineered for, for providing flow for the human physiology, which is good. Um, it's adjustable in increments of a hundred, and it's, and this can uh, at speeds of around 4,000 RPMs, give or take, that basically you're treading water and av avoids a uh, pump regurgitation. Um, and I talked about underestimating. Now, uh, uh, PI event, pulsatility index, um, what does that mean? So it's really, what it means is, uh, uh, the max for a, for a period as, as a 15 second average, it measures what's the maximum power minus the minimum power over the average power, which means since power is a, a, uh, is a, uh, um, a surrogate for flow is maximum flow minus minimum flow over average flow during that period. And any variability in that flow can be seen as a PI event. Uh, I mean, due, due to changes in LV filling or or native cardiac contractility or, or any other uh, arrhythmias and so on. Um, so any Y fluctuations in, in flow, any drop in flow can, can be interpreted as a PI event. And that, that change is, uh, it's greater than 45%. If you've got PI, if your PI varies by greater than 45%, it's logged as a, as a, uh, uh, a PI event. Um, uh, and this will lead to a drop to in the speed to the preset limit and then gradually increases to the original speed at 50 RPM increments. It can be triggered by things that are relatively benign, like sneezing or coughing or intrathoracic pressure changes, you know, if they have pneumothorax or tamponade or you know, mostly post-operative issues, any LV volume variation or, or presence of intra-aortic balloon pump where you increase the af afterload because of deflation of that balloons quite suddenly, any arrhythmias, uh, the occurrence of RV failure, these can all uh, uh, be uh, uh, represent a PI event. 
or troubleshooting uh, the, the low flow alarm. And, so, and often the PI events associated with low flows in the pump. Um, and then one study categorized what are the causes of persistent low flow alarms. And many, many of, the, of the events are relating to hypovolemia, right? the GI bleeding, 40%. So 40% related to hypovolemia. Often they're just dehydrated or they, they have GI bleeding and sometimes hypertension because your pressure is really high. So you're not getting enough flow and treated with antihypertensive. And importantly, as I mentioned before, inflow or outflow obstructions and it's about a fifth of the, of the time. And um, that's why it's important also to, to get an echo, check the, check the, it's easier to check the inflow on the echo, um, whether it's facing not directly towards the mitral valve or, or get a CT chest with contrast and, and also check the, the outflow as well, and as well as check the inflow. The occurrence of right heart failure is, is a portion of these, and maybe they need a right heart cath and echo to determine their their right heart function and whether determine whether they need any inotropes. And the occurrence of arrhythmias, ventricular tachycardias, and some of them in this study were unknown. So here we have a situation where on, on echo, you see the inflow kind of pointing towards the septum. It's actually sucking on the septum a little bit. You know, you can see it bowing out towards the LV, which can also hurt the RV function. And that can certainly cause low flow alarms. And, and um, or you have material just uh, uh, developing or, or accumulating between the bend relief and between the bend relief here, these little stipple lines and, and the actual graph itself and can be resolved endovascularly with a stent. So uh, important things to rule out if somebody uh, has persistent low flow alarms. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, uh, how um, in hypervolemia uh, increased uh, diastolic or systolic LV pressures can, can reduce head pressures and really increase LVAT flow. If somebody's fluid overloaded, get a, a large increase in LVAT flow uh, uh, for given speed and it can also in, increase your pulsatility as the heart actually ejects blood from the aortic valve. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and often happens in a post-op period, somebody's gotten a lot of transfusions maybe or intravenous drugs or fluid infusions or they've got some cardioplegia because they had to arrest the heart to address some valve issue. Um, and you can that would correlate the increase in flow correlate elevate, elevated CVP PA pressures and and and, um, and output on the swan as that as that fat really drives a lot of flow and, and in a more chronic setting that people can present with pulmonary edema pulmonary, um, peripheral edema abdominal bloating and uh, in that setting diuresis peripheral inotropic, inotropic support or or pressure support um, is needed so that's uh, that can be one of the reasons why um, people are symptomatic, but they have great flows on their fat. They just fluid overload. And we talk about a lot about LVADs and being nowadays, this newest generation being continuous flow devices. And so, you know, on the news, you hear people talk about, um, the, you know, patient who's pulseless and, you know, it's, it's amazing. Um, but that's, that's not always the case. It's because it's, it's a little, uh, as complex as you um, uh, factor in to native cardiac contractions. So here we see if, if the VAD is only supporting the heart, you can get more continuous flow with reduced pulse pressures because flow just goes in one direction, you know, just into the VAD and then goes out into the aorta and the aortic valve remains closed either because there's not enough blood in the LV to eject or heart is too weak to eject or they surgically closed it as, as have some people practice in the past, although that's not a good idea because it doesn't, if the VAT fails, then, you know, we've got no, no other, uh, 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 there's no way to compensate by just, just in, using inotropes to augment intrinsic cardiac contraction. Um, but more commonly, there's some component of aortic valve opening as a result of the native cardiac contractions, and that can augment your flow through the LVAD, and you do get pulse fertility here. So, and so this is in parallel, and then this is in series. You know, parallel is good, I think. So um, partial LVAD in this case is providing partial support. And 
um, especially as the native, if the native heart recovers some contractility or a lot of contractility, you see a lot of parallel circulation configurations. And, um, and it, it's not all or nothing. And you know, depending on fluid status, the, the patient can cycle between one flow configuration to the other. Um, uh, and it requires patency of the aortic valve for parallel, obviously. Uh, managing blood pressure, pulse. Uh, so a pulse may be present if there's a, a native cardiac ejection. Um, and when you're assess, assessing blood pressure, we often, because patients got continuous, thought of as having continuous flow, uh, we often use a Doppler ultrasound with, a, of the, with the arm cuff. Uh, but we need to be careful in terms of what we are measuring and, and correlate that with patient status. You know, if they're cold and clammy, and, their, and the pressure you read on the Doppler is 70. Um, and you, if you think that's, con that's mean blood pressure, it may not be, maybe just systolic pressure um, that's coming through and you pump uh, some degree of malfunction or thrombosis. And it's very, it's really important to correlate that and, and, um, with patient uh, clinically. And that may trigger a measurement of LDH for thrombosis, CT, or, or maybe go to the unit and get a swan. So uh, this blood pressure interpretation needs to be, um, uh, do, do not necessarily feel safe is what I'm saying. If you've got a, I've got a, a, a map which, which, uh, which is good, or you think it's a map, but it's actually systolic. Um, and your map is actually much lower. You can get man, do manual blood pressure assessment with the hand. Uh, with the what I just men mentioned, you know the caveats. Really, invasive monitoring is the only way to really differentiate between what's the actual blood pressure of a patient and correlate clinically. Optimal blood pressure range is about seventy or, uh, to eighty. Uh, uh, so mean pr mean pressure. Uh, increased blood for hypertension above ninety uh, can really increase your complication risk. And studies have shown that. It, can have increased stroke, decrease uh, pump output because of that increased afterload and, and increase your aortic or mitral insufficiency. Anticoagulation. So it's been um, uh, uh, typical that we give aspirin, you know, 81 or 325 milligrams. Um, it's unclear what dose is better necessarily uh, to patients with LVAS traditionally. Um, Although with the heart rate three, that's been brought into question, and there's there's an Irish trial which really looks at whether you need aspirin at all. So, so that's something that's uh, that that's been looked at very closely. And but the Coumadin range is uh, INR range is two to three, um, and really the heart rate threes, by and large, um, uh, uh, re greatly improve the thrombosis rate to one point two percent at two years. And then during that two years in the momentum trial, there's no reoperations, pump replacements, or urgent transplants. Uh, but keep in mind that you can still ingest uh, uh, thrombus from externally, not developing in novo, de novo inside the pump, but externally and, and cause strokes and pump thrombosis. And, and um, a lot of us uh, in patients with AFib now uh, remove or clip the left atrial appendage for that reason. And when we adjust um, pump speeds, um, we, it's important to certainly in the OR and subsequently look at the septal positioning. Um, uh, you need, there are multiple goals when adjusting pump speed, but this is one of them. To make sure your LV is unloaded, an important one, um, to make sure it's not going out that one, to the left towards the RV, but making sure that it's more centered to provide, providing adequate support of the LV without tugging on the septum, which can hurt right heart function as it happens right here, where the septum is really bowed out to the left side, really negatively impacts RV function. So you really cannot increase your, your LVAT speed, you know, infinitely. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a delicate, it's actually a delicate uh, uh, a compromise or, or operation. Um, so optimizing uh, LV, uh, LV, LVAT flow you know, to optimize speed for septal um, orientation, uh, maintaining uvolemia, may need to address uh, mitral and tricuspid regurgitation, use of inotropes or right heart, and 
and um and during the operation we especially during the post-op period we're concerned about um you know just the act of putting patients in bypass and certainly clamping the order and causing a, a, a period of ischemia to address valve issues can can impact uh, uh, cardiac function in the immediate postoperative period and avoiding hypovolemia and keeping the pressure reason blood pressure reasonably high to help out that right heart. Um, now we're going to get into a little bit more detail about the aortic valve uh, and the aortic valve regurgitation. Uh, it's really a common thing uh, in in patients who receive LVAS. More than fifty percent had mild AI if they didn't have it before two years. And 11% had moderate severe AI at one, at one year. And it's really caused by a constant afterload, certainly if your aortic valve is an opening and the pump pumping blood into the aorta and just constantly pressing on that aortic valve can cause injury and thinning of that valve. Um, also, your pump is also sucking uh, or driving blood in inferiorly and kind of pulling the aortic valve from below. And you can also get turbulence here. Uh, because you're actually checking blood from above, so you're getting turbulence at the root and uh, and the loss of aortic valve opening. And you can cause a closed circulatory loop here, where a portion of the output from the vat doesn't go to the go to the patient's body, but just recirculates uh, inside the pump, uh, depending the amount depending on how much AI or aortic insufficiency you have. And here we see some pictures of some uh, patients who've had LVADs and see some fenestrations here. In the in the aortic leaflets, um, uh, here you get fusion of the commissures, um, and um, uh, uh, and really limiting this uh, uh, opening here. And not shown here, but you can also get fibrosis and retraction of the leaflets, which is uh, which contributes to development of AI. How to mitigate this? You know, really, is adjusting the pump speed right now. Uh, for to obtain the lowest pump pump speed that gives you good LVM loading and good flow while allowing the aortic valve to open at least every three to five beats, so it's not getting pushed on by, by from above by the afterload and and um, thought to promote aortic valve uh, health. And people have shown that doing this helps mitigate aortic insufficiency in the setting of LVAT. Um, incorporating maybe in the future there may be some out algorithm with incorporating post post dive flow to to uh, 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 to promote aortic valve opening um, and what you see on on the van when you have significant AI um, is that you will read higher higher flows you get high flows uh, than than what the clinical condition of the patient suggesting so then inadequately supported in terms of end organ perfusion but they the, the LVAS reading a good flow. Um, you can, the inability to offload the LV can lead to increased RV afterload and contributes to RV failure. And here we show where the alpha graph goes and can also certainly impact uh, with computer modeling of, of, you know, if the alpha graph is low, it shoots into the wall of the aorta and that causes a lot of turbulence and a lot of turbulence down the root. And that can uh, promote AI development. Whereas if you point the LVAT kind of a little higher and have, to, have the have the momentum shoot towards the arch, it's, it's not to promote here. It shows that there's more lamer flow, less red and or, or orange, and it doesn't impact cause less turbulence at the root and impacts um, impacts uh, uh, the aortic valve less. And how well how do we deal with uh, AI sometimes either going in getting an LVAD and having AI or having to go back in a patient with an LVAD uh, who has significant AI. Um, you can put a central stitch here and really, you know, that this is a very simple, relatively simple thing to do. Um, and a uh, 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 very short clamp time, you know, probably under, under 15 minutes. Um, or you can, if the valve leaflets are very poor in quality, you can do aortic valve replacement. And there's a, a, a akin to the mitral ring that replaces. There's now an aortic valve ring that's available that can be used. And, and the nice thing about either replacing or, or using analoplasty is that the valve still works. So if the patient has recovery, then then uh, they they can uh, they can recover. Just explant the valve, and there's no 
Um, but some patients are too sick for to undergo, you know, if they have an LVAD and they have significant AI, they're just too sick to undergo another operation. They, they may be in love RV failure and liver dysfunction. In that case, um, a, a TAVR or transcatheter aortic valve can be used to uh, address that problem. Although I would suggest uh, it be performed in a center that's, uh, that's familiar with the sizing and choosing the patients and so on, because there's very little calcification often in these patients in the aortic analyst that's needed to see these valves. What about mitral regurgitation? What's the problem with MR? I mean, um, uh, you're still getting inflow. Why does, why does that matter? Because if you have significant MR, um, you're regurgitating, regurgitating back in the left atrium and, uh, um, uh, and that increases the left atrial pressure, PA pressures, and that in, imposes an afterload on RV. And over time, that can contribute to RV failure. Um, and also, you're, if you're, you have some native contractility, you're not really uh, maximizing or, or taking advantage of that because a lot of that contractility just goes back into the LA and not out the aortic valve. So that, that actually does reduce your native uh, contribution to the cardiac output and optimize pump speed to reduce LV size, decrease function in MR. That's certainly true. A lot of MRs does resolve with uh, just downsizing that ventricle, but there's a limit to that because it can't suck on the LV infinitely. So you can get into septal positioning problems. So that's where surgery can help. And how do you choose these patients? And by and large, moderate MR patients uh, pre-op resolve the MR after they place a VAT. But for severe MR patients with severe MR, there's often a lot of leaflet retraction. And, um, and, and downsizing the LV with the VAT alone may not be sufficient to result in MR. Um, and that occurs in patients with very large LVs and a very high degree of leaflet retraction. So these grade three patients with heart is four times normal size and can't resolve that. And if that's the case, it's possible to just intraoperatively place a mitral ring and that can take that totally out of the equation of having to optimize your pump speed to resolve the MR. Um, some people place out fury stitch, uh, although the longevity is un unclear. Mitral replacement, that's really done for people with mitral stenosis. Mitral clip, there's a lot of interest in mitral clip. And um, we're actually talking about mitral clip uh, in the setting of MR at the upcoming ICHLT and this forum that we're involved in. And, and uh, uh, I won't talk about that too much, except you can uh, implant that either after the VAD's in and you've got significant MR, but you risk embolizing that, that clip, or they've had one already before, that severe MR, they had one before, it didn't really improve their symptoms very much, they had heart failure and they come for, for uh, LVAN, and by and large, we just leave those clips in place. And this, the pump still gets adequate flow. And tricuspid regurgitation is the final valve we're going to talk about. It's, uh, it's a marker. It's unclear whether it's, well, it is a marker of RV failure because you've got um, hard morphological changes where the tricuspid analyst is dilated and, already, and the RV is dilated. Um, and that may be, that's certainly a marker for RV, but this can certainly impair RV function or um, uh, because a lot of that flow goes backwards. But it's depending on your degree of RV dysfunction, um, uh, it may be a good thing because you have a pop-off valve. But so there's a lot of controversy re concerning this. It's not very clear. But even if you repair the tricuspid valve, there's a 38% repair failure rate. Um, and a lot of these tricuspid valve regurgitations, even if significant resolve with LVAD implant. But so the jury's out, still out there. And clear, I believe there are groups conducting a randomized trial on this. There's some inter interaction with significant MRT. If you've got significant amount more afterload in your RV, you're more apt to get tricuspid regurgitation and, and um, again, optimize speed. So this, with speed optimization, uh, ramp studies, you know, certainly we want to get an echo you know, during the initial LVAT state, but uh, to optimize speed um, usually occurs in a period where the patient's relatively stable, maybe one or three months after uh, their LVAT implant. And um, you yeah, commonly have an echo and you have Cardiac cath at the same right heart cath at the same time, and there are, there's few goals. I mean, but number one is to provide excellent end organ perfusion. We like want to 
allow aortic valve opening, minimize mitral regurgitation, minimize tricuspid regurgitation, centralize the septal position, achieve LV and LA unloading, and reduce PA pressures. That's a lot of goals to really um, uh, to manage with just adjusting speed alone. So sometimes in the extremes of anatomy, well, that's why it's good to address the aortic valve or mitral valve surgery at the time of LVAD implantation and, and takes away some of these, achieve some of these goals without having to depend on speed. Um, so LVAD therapy implementation entails a very complex matrix of considerations from engineering and pump design to medical and surgical considerations as a patient candidate, how are they gonna do? Should they go straight to transplant? And, um, social issues, can they, do they have access to electricity? Do they have uh, people to help them? Are they adherent uh, to the necessary uh, uh, anticoagulation therapies and, and cleanliness issues? Uh, because LVADs have a predictable uh, implant issues, you know, for, for some patients. Um, whether it's readmissions for heart failure or driveline issues, um, um, infection. Uh, so really important to discuss the patient and their goals and requires extensive uh, multidisciplinary team uh, network of, of people or teamwork. Um, and it often dovetails with heart transplant candidacy in the future. And, but uh, I think it's a very exciting field because there's a, a lot of biomechanical and bio biomolecular science, uh, which makes this exciting. It's, it's a forward-looking field and, and uh, um, uh, the, the, the sky's the limit. In the ending, and this, I, I've been very privileged to, to, to be here working with a very talented group of, of individuals with a vast array of expertise from cardiology colleagues to surgical, my surgical colleagues. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Pagani, Dr. Hafton, um, uh, dietitians, coordinators, uh, 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 people who work on finances and, and uh, uh, you know, world-class researchers and or palliative care in some cases, that's what uh, the patient, um, what's best for the patient. Um, so it really takes a fill, certainly a village, but maybe a small town to to accomplish all this. So I'm very thankful to be a part of this uh, team that I, I basically wandered into. So it's a great privilege. Uh, thank you. And, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions.